Good evening and a warm welcome to you uh, for this webinar. Uh, myself, Charlie Burton, uh, in conjunction with Tickmill on turning a small trading account into a large one. It seems to be a popular uh, subject. I've done trading challenges over the years to do um, just that. And so I'll be talking a little bit about one of the challenges I did, which was a small account, relatively small and turning that into a six-figure account. But uh, but more importantly, I'll talk through the um, the various aspects, the, the things that I did in order to achieve that. <clears throat> so that most of you can take that away. Um, and as always, when I do a webinar, there are going to be things which you'll take on board and hopefully apply to your own trading and other things that you'll just discard and that is trading it's a very personal journey and so as far as i'm concerned um i'm just going to show you what i do here this evening and i'm going to show you some of the tips and tricks that i've used in order to do these things um you're not going to want to use all of those tips and tricks that's what makes the market the market is so diverse you've got traders using all sorts of tools there is no right or wrong in that regard um there are certainly some overall some uh, some truths in trading and i will go through all of those with you about what makes successful traders okay so let's get into the uh the first slide and of course we have to use the risk disclaimer. Uh, the material provided is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, information or opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author, that's me, and not to the organisation, committee or other group or individual or company. Um, CFDs are complex in instruments and come with high levels, uh, high risk and of losing money rapidly due to leverage, etc, etc. There we go. So let's move into the overview. So what we're going to be covering here this evening is um, the three elements for turning a small account into a large one. These are some of the core elements um, that I believe that every trader needs in order to, to do that. We're going to cover off the plan, the strategies and tricks. And I say tricks, but it is there's strategies involved and the strategies that I use, but also some of the tricks as well that I use within that as well. I'm going to show you some examples of traders who have done just this. And also, I'm going to give you the option, if you want to, to follow my trades. So, you know, for some of you. Now, talking of which many of you probably don't know who, who i am i'll just take 60 seconds to explain i've been trading 27 years started in the late 1990s um i've um i've appeared on the bbc um on a couple of different occasions one was in a trading documentary called traders millions by the minute uh, that i featured on um i've also been on another bbc show here in the uk i've been on bbc radio i've been in the financial times interviewed uh the daily telegraph interviews and 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 of course trading magazines and all that sort of stuff i've won five um trading uh head to, live head-to-head -head competitions at trading shows undefeated at the london uh london forex show among many other things so I've been doing this a long time. I ha I do have a trading community uh, where I am with traders five days a week um, within my community, and I also professionally manage money. I'm um, authorized money manager here in the UK. You can check me out at the FCA. I'm on the register. <laughs> so that always sounds bad when you say that. So let's get started. Right, the 10K to 100K, this challenge that I did, so this was the first, you know, the challenge turning a relatively small account. This was 10,000 US dollars, so at the time around about 8,000 pounds, and trying to turn that $10,000 into 100,000. Why? Why did I even bother? Well, I'll tell you the story behind it. I was actually doing a webinar for a company in America. Um, at the time, or I was uh, going to be doing one. 
And and of course, people say, oh, could you do a webinar for our traders? And you're always thinking, well, um, what could I do? What could I present on? And I thought, do you know what? I, I like to... I, it, back you know to say back then this was actually 10 years ago now and i thought i could do some live trading but it's only live trading over an hour or so while you're doing a webinar i know why don't i do um a trading challenge where i'm going to be trading and i'll do a webinar and then i'll do regular updates with that group of traders over a sustained period of time so what i decided to do was to see if i could do 10k into 100k in two years so there's no element of luck in it you know sometimes people can make a lot of money in the space of three months and then they give it all back sort of thing um so let's see about doing it over a sustained period of time so i I said to the group of traders want to see if i can do it over two years all right so it's a 900 percent return over two years and so that was how that came into being if you will Now, um, as it turns out, it took me two years and eight months, so I didn't achieve it in the two in the two years. And the irony is, uh, I think the the ten k uh, the two year mark, or just before the two year mark, that ten k had got up to uh, about. 60k i think it was so the equity had been doing you know going up and got up to 60k and then i put my foot down um thinking right let's just get this thing done because it is a pressure when you're doing these things um it is a pressure to deliver you've got people having high expectations of what you're gonna do and and so i'd got to close to the two-year mark and thinking oh, let's just get this done you know i was really close or maybe it was more maybe it was 80k yeah it was about sixty thousand pounds at that ta- time yeah so maybe eighty thousand dollars and um and of course i put my foot down what happened i went into a drawdown so then it took me another eight months uh to to trade out the drawdown and then finally get to that that target so that was a little bit about what i did why i why i did that i constantly now do trading challenges because i find doing trading challenges is good to show people uh what can be achieved um now one thing i always say is you know these sorts of things are speculative they you're not going to turn 10k into 100k risking 0.01 of 1% per trade you know it is higher risk but it doesn't have to be super high risk so i'll talk about risk in just a moment now um without these three things we're going to move into the three essential elements now i've done enough on what i've done i'm going to talk about the 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 techniques i used and all of that in just a moment so without these three uh, uh, elements you can chuck the, the strategies in the bin so first and foremost i know it's very basic but you need to have a trading plan so I set out a trade plan with the goal to uh, to try and turn 10k into 100. So how did I go about doing it? You know, that's a huge goal to turn a small account like that into a larger account. Well, break it down. So the first thing that I did in the trading plan was to break it down. Okay, what do I need to do with that 10k in order to start propelling it up? So when I first started trading on this, I was purely day trading for the first about three months. After that, I introduced swing trading into it as well. So what I needed to do was to figure out, okay, um, if I could average on this uh, $50 a day, $50 Per day, or could I average fifty dollars per day on this account? Okay, so that's a half a percent per day, right? So, zero point five percent per day. And so, by breaking it down like that, thinking, yeah, I think I can do that. Okay, but trading the markets is not a job, as you all know. Um, returns are um sporadic they come in all sorts of shapes and, and sizes 
you don't make consistent profits is what I'm trying to say. You don't make the same amounts of money every day. So in order to average $50 a day, what I needed to be doing is on the winning days, I needed to be making $200 to potentially $300 on the winning days because I knew that I was going to have plenty of losing days as well. You don't make money every day. So if I could be making somewhere like that sort of amount, and some days it might be a bit more than that, on average, you know, can I make two to three hundred dollars on a winning day? Because I know that I'm going to have those losing dates as well. So then it'll average itself out towards fifty dollars a day. Okay, right, we're getting somewhere. So this is the plan. This is what I'm talking about. You have a trade plan. Well, okay, I've got a goal. How do I go about doing it? Yes, within the trading plan were the strategies that I was going to be using as well. I'm going to be talking about those in just a few minutes. But we have to break it all down. So, okay, in order to average a given amount, you've got to make more than that on your winning days because you're going to have losing days. All right. So how much risk am I going to be taking per trade? So in order to to achieve a half a percent on average per day, that means I'm going to have winning days, plenty of losing days, but it'll average itself out. How much do I need to risk? Well, For this challenge, I allowed myself up to 2% risk per trade. And I say up to because I didn't necessarily take 2% risk on every trade. Depended on the trade setup, how the trade was looking, whether I wanted to have a smaller risk on that particular trade or a full risk. Full risk was 2%. Okay. Okay. So a lot of the trades, I was risking, you know, 1% per trade. And if it was a winning trade and I got um, a one to two risk to reward on it, then I would obviously be banking $200. Um, And if I get a couple of trades come through, you know, they're not all, from an intraday perspective, all going to be one to two. Some are going to be less than that, one to one and a half, that sort of amount. But certainly as I started to put the plan together, right, okay, In order to achieve $50 a day, which is over the course of a month, I'm going to have to get rid of that now. So over a course of a month, 50 bucks a day, there's about 22 days on average in a trading month. So uh, that's what, $1,100 in month one. Okay. So, but then we start compounding it. So... I, I'm thinking, right, okay, I think well, you know, we can do that. That's that's 11%, so to speak, in month one. Okay, if I can average that. And then what I'll do is I'll then compound it because now that account's grown and then I'll be looking to make $60 a day and then 70 and 80 and 100. As it turns out, when it turned out, the first three months I averaged <laughs> uh, about 50% per month in the first three months. So I got lucky. So I quit very quickly turned that $10,000 into over, it was about 50, maybe not every month, but uh, maybe a 40 or whatever. But it was within three months, it was up into the 20,000s, okay? Above $20,000, $25,000. So I got a bit lucky. Everyone gets a bit lucky here and there. But I certainly didn't do that after, after that. So everyone has a little winning streak here and there. But that was the plan. The important thing is the plan. And then from there, I could then grow. I could then grow the plan. Um, I've got the capacity to be able to make that given amount. I could increase it if I wanted to risk more and all of that. So trade plan first and foremost. Right, I can now got the goal at the top. Then how am I going to achieve the goal? Right, okay, let's do the numbers. Right, as for day trading, I can do that. Right. Then I'll introduce swing trading. What techniques, what strategies am I going to use? Right. Write those down. Okay. Uh, mostly Forex. I think um, I was trading the S&P as well. Um, so I always trade the S&P a bit. Now, risk I've already covered off. Um, that was up to 2% max risk. So I would trade within that. So a lot of trades would be at 1%. 
But, you know, there'd be a fair few that would be, you know, at max risk as well at 2%. So if I was risking two and then I'm, and I get one to two risk reward, then obviously I make a bit more as well. But, you know, so I'm a trader who does vary my risk. Okay. So I'll trade within a risk parameter up to 2% which means that some trades I might be risking 1%, another one I might be risking 1.5%, another one maybe 2 Some people don't like that, and that's fine. Um, like I said at the beginning, each to their own when it comes to uh, a lot of the things, like I said, that I'm going to go through tonight. Not everybody is it going to suit. Some people like fixed risk on every trade. That's fine. So I'm just showing you what I did. This is all part of that trade plan. Different people are going to... Um, uh, are gonna uh, get there differently then of course we've got mindset uh mindset probably the most important thing of everything um i spend my life talking about mindset if i could be a you know if i all i talked about in trading was trader mindset which is a lot uh <laughs> i would be happy uh because i think most people still even though they understand mindset i still think the large majority of traders hugely um underestimate just how important this is so in order to turn a 10k into 100k you've got to have a strong mindset so whatever your goal is and i'm going to share some uh other examples tonight as well of some other traders uh, doing similar things but uh so for example let me give you an example of mindset um so my, that equity like i said it got i got like oh, close to two years and i just thought oh i'm really close i'll put my foot down i'll 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 put you know a few extra trades on or whatever it was at the time at max risk um so still at the max risk but you know i just wanted to put my foot down so i was eager to get the trade the uh the challenge done and then what happened was it went from it was about sixty thousand pounds at that time, and it dropped back down into the thirty thousands. So I had a fifty percent drawdown. So when it comes to speculative trading like this, the bigger the gains you're going for, the bigger the potential drawdowns you're going to get. It's as simple as that. The bigger in in all walks of trading, if you're trying to make ten percent in a year then, you know, you should, you know, expect to have maybe a 5% drawdown. If you're looking to make 20% in a year, you've got to expect a potential 10% drawdown and so on and so forth. So the bigger the the potential returns, then the bigger the potential drawdowns. So anyway, so I went through from 60,000 back down to 30. You've got to have a strong mindset to be able to deal with that and then trade out of it back up and then getting to the 100k so and there's a lot that goes on with mindset you know when you have your losing trades when you go through a losing period there you know not allowing it to affect you and then getting maybe too cautious or too fearful all those sorts of things so mindset is huge it's a whole body of work i could never do it mindset justice in the space of one webinar um i do i think i have done a, a previous mindset webinar uh with tick mill and i've got i will have a look at the recordings in just a moment so um certainly um that is a huge thing um with regards to um doing any sort of trading whether it's this or or just normal trading mindset overcoming greed and fear you know reducing your emotional range is so so important and mo this is the reason why most people quit it's because they can't they don't they never invest their time and energy in their mindset okay so what we're going to now do um is we're going to get over to the strategy element the first thing that i'm going to say is strategies are not the holy grail uh they are this is the bane of my life uh like i said i've been i've been trading personally now for 27 years um i've been training traders on and off now for the past uh well we in 2024 so about 22 years 
And yes, you have to have strategies, but they are the holy grail. If you you can have a great strategy, but if your mindset's not there, you'll always underperform the strategy. So the the real holy grail is your mindset. You know, you can have an okay strategy and you'll still end up failing with it uh, because of your own psychology. Having said that, we do have to have strategies uh, and entry techniques and all of that. And I have them, of course. I have, I use a range of entry techniques and um, I'm going to go through uh, those with you now. Yeah, I can see questions coming through, but I can't answer all that. Yusuf, I've just seen your question there. Brett, I'll come back to yours because yours is specific to what I said about risk. You said, uh, what determines your risk per trade? As in, if you decide trade one will be 2%, trade two will only be one. Yeah, I'll have a, you know, like a checklist, Brett, you know, and there might be two trades, which they both score, one scores, let's say, nine out of 10 on a checklist and the other one scores seven out of 10. They're both worthwhile taking, but you know, I'll score, I'll downgrade the seven out of 10 a little bit by uh, risking down. It's not leverage. No, don't get confused with leverage. Leverage is how much leverage a broker is giving you. This is 1% at risk of your account. So if you've got $10,000 in an account, I'm risking $100. That's it. And you just use the, uh, a calculator. So if I'm going to take a trade, which has a, for argument's sake, a 100 pip stop loss. And I've got uh, $10,000 in a trading account. Doesn't matter if it's $2,000, whatever. But that's what this challenge was. $10,000 in a trading account and a 100 pip stop loss. Then I just use a um, an online you know, trading calculator to, to pop that in and say, oh, and I only want to risk... Uh, 1.5% of my account on this trade. Okay, there you go. You pop that into a trading calculator and it'll tell you how many lots is correct. So what the lot size is going to be uh, so that you're only risking 1.5% in that example. So you just use a calculator. It's as simple as that. Right. Okay. Um, uh, yes, Andreas, it is being recorded. Um, so... What do I use? And this is something that I've used for many, many years. Multiple time frame divergences. Now, I'm going to go over just briefly here to... Uh, there we go. Where is it? Okay. So I'm just going to go over to... This is... Tickmill very kindly put together a, a little Charlie Burton hub. Um, and on this hub, uh, this is... Someone asked earlier, was it... Um, which I can't remember, remember who asked. Um, there's a lot of information on here. If you open a Tickmill account through this hub, yes, Tickmill will uh, fund you in order to join my community. So I've got a community of traders. I'm there every day. And um, basically, if you open a Tickmill account, they will um, they will they will they will fund they will pay your subscription for you basically. Um, now, what is there else to say? I'll give, I'll put this link up because it's such a long link. Actually, it's a bit of a shame. It's a long link, so I'll just type it into the uh, into the chat channel there, so you've got the link. If you're watching this as a recording right now, and you're like, "Well, I, I was I'm watching this in two weeks' time, Charlie. Um, how do I access it?" Well, let me just um, I'm just going to bring it up. Um, so there's a, there it is. So if anyone has any issues trying to open an account, please email Giuseppe. I'm putting Giuseppe's, uh, there we go. I've just popped Giuseppe's email address. He's always said, look, if anyone has any issues opening accounts or any questions on this, just email me. So if you think, oh, no, I'm out of jurisdiction or whatever, just email Giuseppe. Giuseppe's, uh, for those of you who are watching this as a um, after the fact, and you're obviously not going to be seeing the chat box, um, Giuseppe, double P, E. 
Giuseppe at tickmill.com. That's it. Giuseppe at tickmill.com. If you just email him, he'll answer all your questions. Okay. Right. Now, what I was going to do is just scroll down here. There's a load of information on here. But if you scroll down, look, there you've got my previous webinars. Great. And there it is. This webinar here. So if you scroll down, there's a little arrow here. It'll, it'll default over to here. You see this little arrow on the right-hand side. So it's got a number of the webinars I've done this year. If you click on that arrow, then it'll take you through to this mastering multiple diversities this was a big monster webinar if any of you were here for that um it was a big one so i'm not going to go into detail on webinar on on diversities here tonight because i've given everybody here the link to this page if anybody's watching the webinar and you're thinking how am i going to type all that url out just email giuseppe and he'll give you my hub charlie burton hub and he'll give it give you the link so that uh mastering multiple diversities uh do check that one out because i'm not i can't spend three hours going through that uh, again here tonight so what i am going to do though is let's get the presentation back so I am going to go through some elements. I'm going to go through multiple time frame support and resistance. This is what I use. And like I said, trading doesn't need to be rocket science. There's not some magic thing that I used in order to turn these small accounts into large accounts. And it's the same with the traders that I'm going to share with you in a bit. There isn't, there is no holy grail. There is no magic formula. Um, people will try and spin that to you, but there isn't. So I use basic, relatively basic stuff. Don't get me wrong; it all comes together, and you know there's a lot of of uh, moving parts within that. But it's not some sort of secret strategy per se. All right. Okay. So yeah, support resistance, some divergences using multiple time frames. There's more to it than that, of course. But these are some of the things that I was using and risk and reward okay when it came to the swing trading risk and reward is key and i'll be talking again a bit more about that as we go forward okay so let's come over now and actually give you some examples so i'm going to go back to the charts now so we're going to start off with i believe the aussie dollar here so but not where we're at right now. Um, actually, no, we're not. We're going to go to the euro first of all. Yes. Um, let's put this into replay mode. That'll do. Okay. Don't worry too much. I've just got some moving averages on my charts here. So I'll just talk you through what I've got on my charts. I've got some moving averages, just standard. The gold ones are 200. The black ones are 100 sorry a 50 the green ones are 100 and the blue one here is a 20 doesn't matter if you use moving averages i don't mind what you use again i'm not here to tell you what to use and what not um i'm just showing you here what i use and what i've used as and what i still use as a professional money manager to this day down the bottom is a standard macd um it's just an MACD indicator with the standard settings. 12, 26, and 9 is your out-of-the-box settings. That is what I use. Okay, so I'm not going to spend loads of time on divergences, but I hope that people, ca what you can see is a divergence is when an indicator is moving in the sort of opposite direction of what price is doing. It's diverging against price. Uh, Andy, uh, uh, Athenbill, I've already shared the screen um, up above with the... Can you not see the screen? You can see the screen, can't you? Uh, oh, now I better double check. Can you see my charts? You can. Right, phew. <laughs> That's all right. Good. Okay. So we've got a low here and we've got a low here. Point one, point two. Okay. Now we've got an MACD, the MACD line, which is the blue line. So again, down 
with point one, we can see the blue line made a low here, made a trough. At point two, when price made a new low over at point two, the MACD line was making, in the process of making, a higher low. Okay, it's as simple as that. Obviously, there's a lot of detail in that. I've just said it's simple. There's a lot of detail in it. But that's where I'm afraid you're going to have to, in your own time, please, to, I say I'm afraid, it's a brilliant webinar. Please watch that webinar there. This one here, just click on the link and you can watch that all about divergences and how I use them. Okay. Ah, uh, Athembel, you're going to need to, I would log out and log back in because it's only you. So if you're seeing strategies are not a holy grail, it's got stuck at your end. So if you just log out and then log back in, it should work for you. There you go. Cool. Okay, so that's it. That was That's just a diversion. Okay, I'm not going to go into all the detail, like I said. Right, let's get rid of replay mode here. So I'm now going to go through the sorts of things that I would look for. Um, so I'm going to first of all go to um, an example, because this is all through that time when I was trading that stuff. Uh, Aussie dollar in 2016. So 2016, the Aussie dollar had come down. Let me just zoom out a little bit. So hopefully you can all see Uh, hopefully you can all, uh, Amit, just scroll up and I've put a link into the box. <laughs> I'm laughing because I've just, actually, I'll do it again. They, oh no, that's not it. Scroll up within this chat box. Or oh, maybe it's not showing it for you again. Oh, hold on. I'll, I'll share it again. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is it. Uh, there's the link. Copy. <laughs> uh, there you go. Right. Save that link. <laughs> okay. So, back to the chart. It's simple stuff. You know, buying support, selling resistance is the basics of trading. Oh, you can pin the message, can you? Uh, oh, maybe I can. Well, I don't know. Uh, don't know, it doesn't. Anyway, me to everyone. I don't know. Okay. Trend line going way back, which started off the lows in 2001 and 2002 just a straight ten trend line analysis the the irony was <laughs> that the aussie had really fallen off a cliff in 2014 basically the dollar was having a great run all right it was the dollar was having a great run against a lot of the currencies during 2014 but then he came slam dunking it down into this trend line here that i had on my chart so what i tend to do and this is just one example don't pigeonhole what I do, this is I'm going to show you a number of examples of what I do, but it's support and it's long term historical horizontal support as well. So I had this overlap here. Now that's on the monthly chart. So where did I trade it from? So we've come down to a load of support. Then I look for divergences like I've just shown you. So if I now go to the weekly chart and I'm just going to go to 2016. Let's change that to 2016. There we go. Um, right down here, this is that same level with the trend line and the horizontal level. And so I was trading, busy trading the Aussie dollar. Once it bounced up here, so we've got the two lows. We've got, you know, a multiple divergence here. Again, all that detail of divergences is on the on my homepage there. Um, and that... And then I was trading off the back of that Aussie. Now, the thing is, a lot of the time, I'm trading off the smaller time frames, then running the trade on um, on the higher time frame. So I might be getting in off a smaller time frame. There might have been a... Um, also, I don't know if there was actually a, a divergence on the, on the daily chart, but I'll be looking to find entries once i can see we're getting divergences coming in um i'll be looking for smaller time frame divergences as well and because the smaller they are the time frames then the smaller my stop loss which means the bigger and then i can then run the trade based on this weekly time frame and that's where i can get uh 
big multiples of risk to reward. Plus, I add in as I'm going along. So I'll add in at some certain point. So I haven't just got the initial entry. I've also got uh, a subsequent entry as well. So that's how I do it. That's how you end up compounding your gains. Some of you, I'm sure, already do that, but that's what I do. Okay. So that's just one example. Let's move on. So let's take this back. So now, oh, this is a nice example. Dollar cat. This is all during that, what was going on at that point. Um, during that time, during that, that challenge, these are just some of the trades that I was taking. So another one here was on dollar cad. The dollar cad was in a lovely upwards trend. In fact, what I'm going to do is again, put this into replay mode so you can sort of see. Right. Okay. So you can see that it was in a lovely upwards trend and it just done a pullback on this time frame. This is a monthly time frame. I don't care. We've pulled back on the monthly. So what am I going to do? And it's pull back into this prior price action going way back as well. I'm going to now drill down to the smaller time frames and look for divergences on the smaller time frames. So there were divergences on the certainly on the weekly charts and I think the the daily charts at that time. So um and the funny thing was that um I had traders saying to me at the time, oh Charlie, looks like you're going counter trend <laughs> because they're looking at a daily chart. This has just pulled back for three months. So on the daily chart, in fact I'll take you to it, where are we? Uh April 2016. So let's do that. 2016. Okay, go Oh, I need to take it to uh, a daily chart, don't I? That'd be useful. Right, now go to 2016. I'll just scroll it back a little bit. There it is. This, this pullback here is that three-month pullback you just saw within a massive upwards trend on the monthly chart. So, but of course this looks like a downtrend, and it is a downtrend on the daily charts. I don't care about that. I'm going to be trading the divergences down here to get myself long. So again, I can trade that off the smaller time frames. In fact, I think it was a four-hour divergence I actually got the, the first position of um, to trade that then on the on the long side. So again, it was a great example there to capture a load of points on dollar cad. It was the same thing that happened actually for dollar cad, just uh, in relative terms, a short while later. Oh, I need to get rid of that now uh so just a year later or so price came back down into this whole support zone again it's now on the 50 period moving average which is facing up all good stuff and and applied the same principles we had divergences again down there same thing again so higher time frame analysis looking for price to pull back into support then drill down to the smaller time frame, looking for a divergence to execute. Right, I'm going to give you another example. Same stuff again now. So here's another example. Um, Euro dollar, 2018. So first things first. So 2018 um, is about where my cursor is. So it's just this. This is on a monthly chart. So... The euro had already had a good run through 2017. It started breaking up. So when I'm looking for price, if it's breaking up, I'm looking for the next level for it to run to, which was a 200 and the 100 moving average. And that all came in with all of these prior lows as well. So I was looking to run a trade into that next resistance zone. Okay. Okay. But what was going on on the smaller time frames? So let's go down. Daily chart now. 2000 and what did I say? 18. So let's just do the go to. Change that to 2018. Um, and then um, it was back in the January. There we go. I'll do. Ah, here we go. So um, what had actually happened on the daily chart was price had broken up here. And had just done this lovely little three bar pullback. That all that's all it was. <laughs> I've just shown you what that monthly chart was, and that's all that monthly resistance I was looking to 
run a trade up to. It's the same thing time and time again. So we get a pullback into support. We've got a bit of moving average support and prior highs. All basic stuff. What was going on there? On the hourly time frame, guess what? Oh, smaller time frame, because this is now the daily chart. So I'm now going to go down to an hourly chart or, or a two-hour chart or a four-hour chart. But what was going on is we had divergences on the hourly chart. So I'm getting it on a trade like this with literally like a 30 pip stop loss and and having a run like that. So again, by combining time frames, so you're looking for support and resistance on high time frames in your overall analysis. Then drilling down to the lower time frames to get an entry, which might have by comparison a relatively uh, smaller stop re- relative to the run that you're looking to have. And that's where you can get these exponential uh, returns from trades. This is how I did it. Uh, this is still the principles that I use in my normal trading. So trying to get ultra high risk to reward ratio trades. And the ra- way to do it is combining time frames. So I'm just giving you a few examples here so you get the idea. So I've shown you a divergence. Go By all means, watch the... Um, uh please do watch the as i've keep saying uh that old that web i say old webinar it's just from a few months ago do watch that webinar on mastering mastering multiple divergences because there's a lot more in there and i've got other techniques using multiple divergences in there but i'm just showing you the sorts of things that i was doing oh right pullbacks into support pullbacks into trend lines pullbacks into prior highs coupling up with divergences done you know so and then you get big risk rewards, adding into them as well as it starts moving in my favour. Not on every trade, but on some of them, and and then that gives again it allows for those exponential returns. Yep, Thirandu, you're going to need to watch. <laughs> you're going to need to watch the previous webinar, so to go into the detail because tonight's webinar is about conceptually how do you go about turning a 10k or a small account into a large one like i've already started off going through the trade plan deciding out what's your max risk the things that the tools you're going to need like mindset and all of that so i'm going for all of that so um that's what we're focusing on here tonight the absolute detail you're going to need to take some time watch that webinar it'll just help you um okay uh, in all of that so these are the tri- these are the strategies i'm using the the tips and tricks e- now the, some of these trades were you know most of these trades are swing trades because of i can't go back years on a five minute chart to show you an example okay the data won't allow for it so so i'm showing you just a few uh swing trades that i was doing i've been you know through that whole period um and beyond of course as well just to give you the ideas of the sorts of techniques that I was using. But you can apply these same techniques to intraday. So it's exactly the same principles. So if I'm showing a monthly chart, for example, what's this back on the monthly of euro dollar now? So where were we? Uh, 2018. So if I'm showing this month, this is a monthly chart and I'm looking for price to run up here into these prior, you know, prior lows and, and that key moving average of big moving average there and you know what's going on in the smaller time frames just imagine this is a four hour chart so let's just say this is a four hour chart now and when we went down to that daily chart that would be your equivalent of a five minute it's the same principle so you don't have to do it all on swing trading like these trades uh, some of these trades were it's the same principles the markets are fractal anyway so you're you're trading Top-down analysis, so if you're trading off a four-hour chart or a daily and you're looking at the daily um, for support and resistance or four-hour chart and then you go down to the five-minute chart or the 15-minute chart to look for your divergences and, and to execute. So it's the same principles. Okay, right. Let's go. I'm just going to get the 
So let's go back to the slides. Uh, how do you figure out this? Actually, oh yeah, I probably just read that right. Okay, good stuff. Right, let's go back to the slides here for a moment. So the key was risk and reward. It was the key. Um, I know it's such a basic principle, but it really is. Um, it's what gives you me those outsized return trades. And and the irony was, although when I started that 10K to 100K, the, the first three months gains were all from day trading, uh, the bulk of the gains for that entire challenge were from swing trading. The bulk of the gains were from swing trading, not intraday trading, just letting you know. So the, the intraday got it going. I had a nice lucky spell um, with the intraday, but most of the big gains that got it up, the account up to 100K were from swings. Okay, just letting you know, it's from doing all that stuff. Because I think a lot of people, there's a misconception that people think that, well, if you're day trading, then you'll make more money. And it's not, in my experience, the case. I'm not saying that you don't, you can't make good money from intraday trading. But for those of you who have full-time jobs, do not worry. Most, 99% uh, of day traders lose money. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a very f small percentage that do. So over a sustained period. So, um yeah, don't. What I'm trying to say is, don't worry about it. You don't have to, and uh, and don't think, oh, the only way to turn a small account into a large one is from intraday trading, because it's not true. I did it, and I've continued to do that sort of thing. I'm in the middle of a challenge right now. We I started it at 20k. Uh, when I did the last update, it was at 120k, and so, and again, that's all swing trading. So. If you're sitting there thinking, oh, you know, I can't day trade, you don't have to. Because swing trading, you can get those big risk-reward ratio trades. Okay. Yeah, exactly, Brett. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, well, Marco, that's a valid point. Um, Marco said, um, but surely swing trading will give a lot of uh, swap costs. I guess it could do depending on the on the forex pairs or markets you're trading. So it's a good valid point, and I'm going to answer this. So if you're trading the major currency pairs outside of dollar yen, <laughs> US dollar yen, uh, well, it depends on which side you're on. So if, for example, because the the Japanese have had negative interest rates. <clears throat> They've just gone positive now. But it's still a differential. You know, the Federal Reserve reduced uh, interest rates last night to 5%, didn't they? But Japan are still sitting at marginally above, I can't remember what it is, uh, 0.2 of 1% or something, 0.25, I think it might be. Um, so the interest rate differential, if you're buying yen and selling dollars, so... Um, selling dollar yen basically yeah you're going to pay a more a heavier swap charge than if you're trading euro dollar or pound dollar for example because if you're trading euro usd well the inf interest rate differential is a lot closer i think what's the uh the ecb uh interest rate at the moment is it uh, uh 4.5 percent and now in america it's five percent so the swap charge is a lot lower. So don't worry. And so, and again, it's only if you're long euros, then you're going to be borrowing in euros at four and a half percent. But of course, um, uh, and then you're, but you're selling dollars. So the interest rate differential differential is negative. So you're going to be paying a swap, but it's not that much. I can. I can sit in a euro dollar trade for three or four months quite comfortably. Yes, there is a swap charge, but it's a cost of doing business. If you owned a shop, you're going to, the cost of doing business is having staff. So that for every item that you sell in the, in the shop, it's not pure profit because you've got staff, you've got heating costs, you've got lighting costs, etc. 
So just see it as a cost of doing business. And um, so I won't mind seeing my swap charges going up to 30% of total profit. It's still a, 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 a whopping great big profit. So I don't mind. So, uh, and that would take quite some time if, you know, if I'm in a trade and it's having a really good run, that would take quite some time. Like I said, I can sit at a euro dollar trade paying swaps for easily, you know, four months and it's not really a problem. Okay. But I do acknowledge it does depend on the pair. So for example, (laughs) if I sold dollar yen, I might only want to be in that one for maybe three weeks because the swaps are bigger and they'll build quicker. So, and if you start trading uh, cross pairs, then again, their swaps may be bigger. So uh, my advice, stick with the majors, you know, they're most highly liquid pairs, uh, the major currencies, um, you start going to exotic pairs, you're going to, yes, you're going to be paying lots of swaps. So there's no need to. Stick with the majors, most liquidity, no nonsense going on, no manipulation, so to speak, in thin markets and all of that. Much, much better. Okay. Yeah, I think, and I think another thing that a lot of traders have issues with, when they're day traders, um, I'm going to get to uh, the other traders here, but when they're day traders, they always think, oh God, we've got to hold a position overnight. Um, What if something happens? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they get in dot they get literally programmed into wanting to be flat before they go to bed it's a control issue <laughs> so um uh i've been like i said i've been trading 27 years i've traded through the financial crisis through the bear market of 2000 all of these crises and i've never been massively affected by you know holding positions overnight so um it's just not, you know, you manage your risk by only having a small amount of risk on per trade. And uh, so, yeah, let them run. And um, yeah, so um, I'm covering this with within my community all of the time with my traders. They're watching what I'm doing all the time. They just follow what I'm doing. And, you know, so, uh, yeah. Right. So let's have a look at some other traders. This is what uh, these are just a few traders from my community. So Bandit. Um, I'm just giving some made-up names here, Um, took a 5K account into 50K. But he did that uh, about a year ago, and he did it in three months. (laughs) So now, if you said to me, oh, I've turned 5K into 50K in three months, I'd say, you must have been taking a heck of a lot of risk on. And so that is true. (laughs) To turn 5K into 50K, so 1,000% or 900% on that, in three months, you've got to be risking a a, a lot. So the the backstory on this is, and this isn't something I recommend, Bandit is a fairly wealthy individual. So what he did is he just put 5K, he's got loads of money, so he just put 5K into an account just to see if he could say, like literally be risking like you know 50 percent of his account balance on any individual trade so that's obviously not what what you should do because uh it took him three goes in order to do that (laughs) so he did blow uh three 5k accounts he's got like i said he's got loads of money and he just wanted to do it just for the and then he did make 50k on it so he took very big risks so Probably not the best of examples, but it's just, uh, you know, in theory, you could do that. Okay, these are more realistic now. Doug took an £8,000 account, put it into, t- turned it into £33,000. Someone was talking about adding to trade to accounts earlier on. I'm a big fan of that. And uh, he then added about another 40 k to it. So was then trading at 70 three thousand again doug's got money again but so and then he added more money and he had uh, he was trading with two hundred thousand so he was carrying on making money on the account but he did add from savings now i appreciate not everyone's got that kind of money in savings but nevertheless he still took that initial capital to prove to himself that he could do it he'd been trading for four and a half years at this point 
You know, it took him that time to find his way in trading. And then, then the light bulb went on and then he took a, an 8K account into 33, added to it, carried on making money on the 73 and then added another 100K. So we ended up trading about 200K. Oh, what's next? Karim turned uh, 5K into 35K and then went part-time. So he, he went the other way around. He was doing that full time, um, and um, and then said, "Actually, I don't. I don't think I need to trade full time. I'm just going to trade part time." So, um, so that's what he did, and just and still works that around. He's and he's carried on since that was years ago, and he still part time trades to this day, and still um, you know can make these exponential returns. So I don't know what he does nowadays because he's built his account up now, but. Um, Alan was an interesting one, 10K into 75K and is now full-time. He trades with um, uh, over six figures now, so and he trades full-time now. So, all of, But all of these had one thing in common. The thing that they had in common is they used MTF, multiple timeframes. So just like I've gone through today, they identify a trading opportunity off of support resistance and then go down the time frames to find patterns to get themselves into trades. All of these uh, people did this trading. I see someone said, is this only on Forex? Uh, mostly, I would say on Forex. They might be trading um, within their trades, you know, some uh stock index trade but majority of it was all on forex yes uh, uh amanda i would run for the hills uh amanda said one month before uh it's your translation but anyway you said a trusted trader told me to invest ten thousand dollars and he can give me 1000 monthly. Is it possible? I need your answer. No, don't do it. Run away. Because if traders are soliciting you to say they're going to make you 10% a month, no, they'll lose you all of that 10,000. It will be either a scam or maybe not even a scam, It, but they won't do it. They won't succeed. They'll blow up your account. Please don't do it. Okay, let me move on, and then we'll get to the questions. So, don't think about the goal, first of all. You've got the goal when you write down the goal at the beginning. Then chuck it in the bin and process and concentrate on the process and the plan. When I did that, that goal was so high um, that I didn't know if I was going to be able to achieve it, even though I'd got all that experience. I didn't know. Um, so, I had to forget about the goal and put all my energy and concentration into the into the process of trading so write your goal out then chuck it in the drawer and then that's all you're focused on you've already done your plan you know how much you're going to be risking per trade you know how much on average you would like to be if you're intraday trading how much per day how much per, or, or swing trading how much per week and how work the numbers out of what you need to do that's all done when you write your plan other than that you just get on with focusing on the process okay and to finish off, there's a couple of things. One, Giuseppe's email. Oh, there you go. If anyone's got any questions about opening an account with Tickmill, I'm going to go back to that, actually. Do just email Giuseppe there uh, because there's something else here. What's this? Follow my trades. Um, there's two ways you can follow my trades if you're interested. You don't have to. I don't, I don't care. So I'm not trying to solicit to you particularly. Um but uh, let's go back to, and I say p particularly, <laughs> but uh, there we go. So coming back to this page that I've been sharing here this evening. Again, if you're watching this, I'll just share it again. Uh, oops, has that worked? Yeah, um, there you go. So if you're watching the recording of this, just email Giuseppe for the link to this page. Um, there's a lot of information on there. Scroll down. And there's the uh, the webinars down here. There's a load of them on there. 
But if you go back up, it does say about you can, uh, what is it? Open an, uh, a Tickmill account to access Charlie's community. If you open up an account, um, I think you have to do, I think it's a minimum of, uh, I can't remember, four lots per month. Okay, you need to do a minimum of four lots per month. Um, and then Tickmill will fund you access to my community, which is normally £123 per month. So if you're interested in that, like I said, I'm an authorised money manager here in the UK, so I'm authorised to do this stuff. Um, and then you can watch me as I'm doing trades in my own trading community. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is Tickmill have their own social trading up, which I've only just joined. And I've just done my doing my first trade on it right now as we speak. So this is their uh, social trading hub. And I'm on it. So if you want to look for me, just go to the social trading hub as a as a customer of Tickmill. Type in Charlie Burton, do a, a search, and then you'll find me. You won't see me doing thousands and thousands of percents. I'm, this is a trade I'm in right now, actually. I've only took it a week or so ago. Sixteen days old. Okay, so two weeks ago. So uh, you can do it that way as well. That's within their social trading. Tickmill, I've known for a couple of years now, and I've really enjoyed trading with them and doing all this stuff that I also do with them as well. They're a great company. You get a million pounds, million dollars worth of insurance. I think that's really important. So your account is insured up to a million dollars per person you know if if tick mill ever went bust or whatever um so there's a lot to be said uh about tick mill so do check them out in that regard right uh let's get away from that now and um go through some q a then so okay i welcome any questions at this time there you go i said i'd do it in an hour and we're just on an hour but let's go through some questions here and, and i would encourage you go to that site there's a load of previous webinars that I've done on there on all sorts of topics are well worthwhile having a watch. Anyway, and I'll be back, you know, next month. We'll do another one and the month after that. But there's a back catalogue there as well. Uh, what if we already have a Tickmail account? Can we sign up for the community? Edward, yes, get in touch with Giuseppe. Fire an email to Giuseppe and tell him that you want to do that and, you know, see what he can do. So I don't know how you go about doing all that if you're already a customer but just get in touch with him and um yes he said to me you're more than welcome charlie to have my email address out <laughs> so okay uh thanks blair um another one for the rewatch you're saying yes uh, you need to watch the webinars yes is tickmail open to nigeria i don't know mark uh there are certain ju jurisdictions around the world that brokers can't operate in because of things like uh well regulations and all that so i'm not sure again mark uh get in touch with uh tick mill and do ask how many trades on average did you take per week during the 10k challenge good question theo uh how many instruments currency pairs sift he said okay so um how many trades? I was doing, uh, on average, two to three trades a day, Thirandu, which meant that some days I might do five or six, and other days I might do one. So from the intraday perspective, it wasn't huge numbers, no. Most of the the trading was, the intraday trading was done on the euro dollar, um, but on the intraday basis, most of it was done on the euro dollar and the pound dollar, um, just so you know. On the swing trading, then I would, you know, trade any of the major currency pairs uh, plus the likes of the S and P as well. Okay, that answers your question. Which time frame are you looking for entries? Oh, uh, yes, Dominic. Um, yeah, I think I've just covered. Maybe I've just sort of covered that. Uh, most of the intraday trading. Remember that was only really. Well, no, I I, I carried on the intraday trading through the whole two year or so period but the bulk of the returns ended up coming from the swing trading but um so the day trading what did the day trading give me it acted as a bit of a diversification when when i was having drawdowns in swing trading 
the intraday trading would sort of offset it a little bit and act as a bit of diversification. Um, yeah, where was the question again? Oh, which time frames? Um, yeah, so on the intraday tra charts, it was five minute charts, 15 and 30. Yeah. How do you manage, uh, Johannes? Uh, how do you manage a long-term trade? Stop loss and partials or adding a trade? Yeah, on a long-term trade, um, I I add. I don't take... I will at some point take partials, but the target's a lot further away, so I'm usually adding into the trade as it's going up. Um, so the way to... The one thing with a longer time frame trade... Uh, if I bring up the charts again here. Where are you? There you are. Um, so if I was looking at a, a longer term trade, uh, we've got the euro dollar up here right now. Um, it's all very well. So let's say, let's just drag this down a little bit. Okay. So let's say I've got a target up here. Uh, let's say 115 on the euro dollar okay if i um trail up my stop to every little low that's come in then i'm almost going to guarantee at some point there's going to be a slightly bigger retracement and i'm just going to get trading stopped out there's nothing wrong with being trading stopped out but if you want to go for a bigger target you have to give your stop loss more room so that's the that's the the trade-off you have to give a trade more space to run the the further away your target so um so what i tend to do is have my once i'm into a trade i don't ag too aggressively move my stops up they will get to break even at some point and they will mo be moved into profit at some point but you don't want to be too aggressive on them because if you are, um, then you you know the next pullback is just going to stop trading, stop you out. So uh, uh, let's just uh, reset that. On which time? Oh, to cover that, Aaron. Uh, where are we? Do you still use your signature bands? Yes, I do, Aaron. Yeah. Um, I just haven't put them on my charts tonight. They are there. I just. Kept, tried to keep my my charts a bit cleaner tonight uh considering um you've been playing with them in quant strategies uh to some great success uh which is the most success i've had in quant strategies in my years of experimenting there you go um that's uh great to hear more of okay i'm, I'm not giving saying too much more than that <laughs> can you do swing trading with a small account 100 percent, you can or do you have to day trade and grow your account until you can swing trade? It's a really good question. I'm sorry I didn't cover that off. But yeah, I, and when you say a small account, I appreciate that with swing trading, you've got wider stops. Yeah. So, but this is why you can swing trade off a, let's say, a daily chart here. But you can still find entries to get you into the trade off of the likes of an hourly chart. So that's one way of doing it. But even if you are going to need a, you know, a, for argument's sake, a hundred pip stop. Uh, yes, the minimum lot size in FX is 0 0.01 of a lot. But, you know, so yes, probably a minimum of a thousand dollars in a trading account would then be all right. If you said oh, I've only got two hundred dollars in a trading account, yeah, that's going to be tough. Um, I can't, I can't say anything, you know, outside of that. That's going to be tougher. But yeah, minimum of a thousand dollars that you can swing trade. Yep. Uh, Marco, that's good to hear. Marco's saying Tickmill is one of the most reliable brokers there is for retail traders too. Yeah, the thing is with Tickmill is, you know, Tickmill came into being because of uh the 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 two owners of it are traders they're professional ex hedge fund managers themselves so um yeah exactly uh they um it's a good broker um 
So if you haven't got an account with them, um, of course I'm going to recommend them, but I wouldn't work with them. I've been doing this this trading lark for all these years. I wouldn't just work with any any broker. And so I work with them because I trust them myself and uh, and they're good people to work with. So, um, so yeah, so I am going to, you know, blatantly recommend them to you tonight. Yeah. Uh, Elias, uh, should you set a weekly percentage target? Um, you could do the same um, principles as, um, as with intraday, but just appreciate that when you're trading on it on week to week and on swing trading the the returns are a little bit more erratic because you're holding on to trades for longer and all of that so you're not going to necessarily hit those same milestones so if if anything i would say maybe have a uh, a quarterly you know when you're putting your plan together maybe a quarterly target for swing trading um to give just to give yourself a, a a rough target but like i said then chuck it in the drawer and then just focus on the tr- on the trading because what tends to happen is 80 percent of your gains will end up coming from what 20 percent of your trades anyway so you'll go along for six months you know sometimes hardly making any money and then you're in the space of two or three months, you'll go and make a, you know, some you know, really amazing gains. This is the way it goes. So, um, so, so often is the case in life as well. Uh, um, Tick Mill in India, I don't know. Um, check them out. Um, I'm sure they'll cover India, but do do do. You'll have to get in touch with them. Um, I don't work for Tick Mill. Um, I am completely independent, um, so I don't know every jurisdiction that they deal with so i can't answer every question on that side can you talk more about the psychological psychology of increasing lot size yes edward as the account grows i find this is the big challenge for you as you increase your account size yeah one of the things with increasing account size is um gradually the position size becomes bigger (laughs) and where a lot, I think a lot of traders go wrong is they'll they'll trade at, for argument's sake, one lot, and their account's growing, and then they'll then they'll automatically go to you know two lots, for example. That's a that's a big jump in position size, and you've just you know, it's a hundred percent increase in your position size. So all of a sudden, it's all going to be magnified. So. My first advice is very small increments. Um, So you go from one lot to, you know, 1.01 and then 1.02, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So make sure there's small increments that is growing so that it allows your brain, your your psychology there, your trader mindset to gradually get become accustomed to bigger size. But whatever way we slice it, your account's going to grow and you're going to end up with bigger position sizes. So a lot of what you can do comes down to visualization. And there's a couple of things uh, to note here. So with visual visualizing, a lot of people spend time <laughs> visualizing winning trades. That's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> what you want to do is visualize losing trades. And I'm not joking here. Visualize losing trades. Because it, by visualizing the, you know, seeing the number there, whatever the number might be, whether it's $100 or $200 or $500, whatever it is, if you get used to seeing, visualizing that that number on a losing trade, then it becomes more palatable. And you understand it's the same risk. It's still only, for argument's sake, 1% of your account. It's just that your account's got bigger. So that's one thing that you can do. Here's another trick for you, Edward. If if your account's growing or grown or maybe you've added to it, here's a little trick. Have two accounts at half the size. This is what Doug did, right? So Doug did this. When that account, you know, when I said earlier on, and he and he uh, he added forty k to his thirty three, 
So he was up at about, I know he was up at about 75K. And he said to me, he said, oh, I said the, the numbers were, you know, all of a sudden, because I added to it a lot bigger. So what he did is he split his account with his broker, just, you know, just had a sub account. So he actually was trading, uh, wherever it was, uh, 32,500 separately in two accounts. He said, psychologically, I'm still trading the, the total number. He said, but by logging into the two accounts separately and, you know, I'm seeing a smaller amount of risk per trade. So a nice little trick there. There you go. Um, right. Um, there's, oh God, just so you know, I've just looked at the thing. I've got 31 new messages for me to read through. So, uh, Edward, if you're, if you've said anything, I, it's going to take me a while. Actually, one let's go down. Hopefully maybe he's there. Oh no, there's loads. There's not, oh no, but I can't get down far enough to see Edwards if he's said anything else. But anyway, there you go. It's a good tip for anyone that way. Uh, Marius, uh, if you're trading for 27 years, don't you have already enough money so you wouldn't need to ask money for mentoring and advice for Ting Mill? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a really good question. Why do I do it? And I always say this. So, okay, there's a, there's a couple of reasons why I do this. And I don't do it for charity, Marius. I, you know, yes, Ting Mill pay me to do these for you. So why do I do it? Okay. Number one, significance. Um, I'll be brutally honest with you. Um, I get a kick from training people and the fact that I'm pretty experienced in this. I quite enjoy uh, the fact that I've got a lot of knowledge and sharing that. And I'm not doing it for charity, but it's an e it's, you know, it's a bit of an ego thing. You've asked a brutally honest question. I'm going to give you a brutally honest answer. So significance is part of that. So I get something from this deal, so to speak, when I'm training traders. I also remember, Marius, I manage money professionally as well. I think number two, I, I'm going to write this out in a second. When I first went full-time trading back in 2001 with no other income, and I traded for about th about five years with no other income coming in. So I've been that trader who's traded with no other income, purely trading for a living. One thing that was missing when I gave up my career and became a full-time trader was a sense of purpose. And do not underestimate, because I did just how important it is to have a what you feel to be a role in life and for me a role in life just sitting in front of my term my screens wasn't enough i needed something more to do with my life i needed a sense of purpose i'm a big believer in work too many people don't want to work these days all around the world and one of the best things for their mental health is to actually do a good day's work. So for me, I learned the hard way that actually I had I didn't have a sense of purpose in the in you know at that time. I lost, you know, from working for a company, interaction, all of that stuff. This, what I'm doing here tonight, what I do in my training community, it gives me a sense of purpose. I get interaction. And I satisfy that significance as well. So there you go. Hopefully that answer that answers your question there. Uh, can I see the Q and A? Yusuf, yes. Sorry. Uh, how to develop tra uh, patience for trading in this very fast world? You're thirty with two years trading, and you feel rushed. <laughs> Don't worry. Right. First things first. Two years into trading is nothing. So uh, in trading terms, you're still in kindergarten. So it's nothing. Most traders, it's about four to five years where they start to, you know, reach some level of maturity as a trader. So uh, first things first, take your time. It's about four to five years with a lot of traders before they really start to accrue a bit more experience. There's no substitute for experience. You can learn strategies and whatnot, but you need, you know, there's time is really important so um if you keep that in mind think oh i'm okay here you know 
lots of traders it takes them four to five years oh okay uh that might help with that so um yeah slow down it's not a race trading's going to be with you forever and um yeah um it's not a race that's all i can say Ah, you've got another question here as well, Yusuf. He's saying, um, I'm against day trading, but why not do both if person has tra time? Um, one thing I have to say, I'm not against day trading. I'm not against it. I, you know, I've done loads of day trading myself over the years. Where I'm against it is brand new traders who get into trading. They should not go to day trading because day trading, there's a lot more noise, loads of noise intraday. That, for a newer trader, is a red rag to a ball. It's not going to end well. <laughs> so that's um, that's my first answer. Um, if you have time, then yes, you can both day trade and swing trade. What I tended to find was that they ended up just cancelling each other out. It would be like if I was having a... Draw, as I said earlier on, a bit of a drawdown on swing trading. All of the day trading did was to uh, give me a, a diversification during that period. It's a weird thing. It's not you don't tend to make twice as much. It never seems to work out that way. Bearing in mind, if you day trade and swing trade, right? So you might be day trading and short euro dollar, but you're in a long on a swing basis on euro dollar mentally that's really difficult to get your head around because you're you know you've got this vested interest in euro dollar going up and yet you know on the shorter time frames you know there might be some setups to short it but don't underestimate how difficult that's going to be so you don't have to do both you can absolutely but um if you're gonna do both trade them in separate accounts do not do it in the same account get two accounts um, just so you know, folks, um, I I'm going to work my way through these Q and A's, but there are there's 40 new messages uh, on the block here that I can see, so that I haven't read yet. So you're going to have to bear with me. There's still loads of us here tonight. It's a big whopper of a webinar. Is the Nasdaq good to trade for new beginners? It's okay, Raj. Um, and the Nasdaq, you know, it's uh, I mean, the stock indices are beasts. You know, they you know, but if you want to trade US, yeah, then S and P, Nasdaq, not going to really make much difference. Just keep your risk low uh, and have slightly wider stops would be my advice. Um, uh, that's good to hear. Thank you, Yusuf. You're saying uh, you are one of the biggest reasons that I that made me stick at it after more than a year. That's that's really kind. Thank you for that. John, uh, Mr. Harris here. What advice can you offer for swallowing personal uh, PBs on longer swing for weeks or months with entries on 5, 15, 30 or hourly? In particular, psycholo psychology for managing and holding through Oh, pullbacks. Oh, okay. Uh, what advice can you... Right, okay. What advice can you offer? Okay, well, let, again, let's come to this chart here of the euro dollar. As we can see, the euro dollar, since it made this low in April, it's had one pullback here, two here, and three here. So one thing we have to do as traders when you're holding on for a while is to sit through pullbacks and they're not always nice one thing i would always do is document what is going on on a chart take screenshots of charts and write all over them so for example if you see that day there that big red down day oh god and if i put it into real time now that was non-farm payrolls just a uh, a week ago so let's put that on ah so it's done a pullback it's come up non-farm payrolls um on that day and oh no we've sold off then the following day oh no it's coming right down you're sitting in a position oh god um why am i picking out a news day because 
News events are almost there to try and put you off your trades. Forget intraday trading now. I'm talking about swing trading. There's always news going on which might put you off. Oh, no, that, that, was, that was a good non-farm payrolls. I've been long euro dollar. I better come out. And then, you know, it settles down. And before you know it, oops, um, it's come all the way back up and, and taken out the highs of the non-farm payroll date. So write it down. Go back over a chart and look at any uh, pullbacks and say, okay, what was the news at that time? What was the what were any economic releases during during that phase there? Like this phase here was when there was all this uncertainty because the French presidential elections that all kicked off, didn't it? And so at that point during that phase, everyone thought the euro was going to come down to one o two. I say everyone. Lots of macro guys and, and in the news and stuff. Oh, the euro's going to collapse now. It's all this political uncertainty in the eurozone, blah, 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 in France. And look what's happened. So get a load of charts, go back and do a little bit of um, scurrying around, use an economic calendar and go back and see what was going on on some of those. You know, some of these moves will be as a result of economic releases. Some of them will be as a result of news, like I said, uh, about the French presidential elections and all of that. So, and it helps give you confidence to say, oh yeah, every time there's a pullback, there's always going to be bad news because bad news is what produces the pullback. But the market so often gets some, some new news and they rotate back to the long side again. So a great uh exercise would be screenshots and then writing notes on these screen or on these charts because you'll soon realize oh yeah there's always bad news or something coming out which creates pullbacks so you get used to it and you're saying okay i'm in the middle of a pullback and i use this language a lot until proven otherwise this is just a pullback so when the euro is pulling back here well, and to, till proven otherwise, this is just, it's just a pullback. Technically, it's a pullback within this upwards trend. Keep using that sort of language until proven otherwise. It will help. Make notes, get used to looking at historic charts and uh, making notes about charts in the present as well. And you'll build up a resilience to, oh yeah, every time there's a pullback course, there's going to be some bad news. And before you know it, uh, if they're trending, they will rotate and carry on higher again. There you go. That's that answer for you there, John. Okay, let's move down. Oof, I've hardly getting anywhere, am I? Uh, there's now 47 new members. Uh, you find potential sales manually or use an automated system uh, manually uh, for me. But by all means, you can use scanners. Um, I do have some software um, that is a scanning tool but i don't use it <laughs> not per not for my personal trading i i love the art of trading one of the, the uh, there was a final slide actually um for me trading is deeper than just making money and what i mean by that is that it has to be a mental challenge it's a bit like what i said in answer to that question earlier on from maris about why do I do this? Well, you know, as I said, you know, I need to have a purpose and all those things as far as doing you know, things like I'm doing here tonight. But from a trading perspective, I need to get stimulus from it. It's not just about making money. And funny enough, Bill uh, Lipschitz, who was in the second Market Wizards book, uh, New Market Wizards. And I love this quote because this really resonates with me. If a trader is motivated by the money, then it is the wrong reason. A truly successful trader has got to be involved and into the trading. The money is the side issue. The principal motivation is not the trappings of success. It's usually the byproduct. Simply stated, the game is the thing. You've got to love it. You've got to love trading. And that's what I love. I love trading. So, um, Coming back to um, using scanning software and all that sort of stuff. I love the art of trading. I love analyzing charts and doing it all myself. So if I didn't, I would just use a scanning tool. But then, 
you know, my heart's not in it in the same way, you know. And so for me anyway, I love that engagement. There you go. That's that's your answer there. Do you use smart charts? No. Uh, the quick, quick button access to do trading? Uh, no, don't do any of that. I use my own charts, Bupinda. Sorry, uh, my own analysis. It's all my own. You've got to bear in mind, I'll let you into a little secret. I only look at the major currency pairs. So it's not a huge amount for me to do. I'm looking at them every single day. I know what they're doing. And I predominantly, 80% of my trades are on the euro dollar. So, um, uh, yes, I use Tickmill. Yes. Um, I, I do have other brokers as well, but, but only because I've been with them for years. So I do have an account at Tickmill as well. Um, do you just trade now or day trade as well? No, I stopped day trading years ago. Um, so, uh, time is important thing for me, Brett, you know, day trading requires a lot of time. And as I've got older, I need more time to do other things as well. So swing trading suits me. Plus I get, again, that mental stimulus. I didn't, I got to a point where for me, day trading was just like vanilla trading. Um, it didn't give me enough mental stimulus. Whereas getting into a swing trade, adding to it, which is tough psychologically and holding it and holding it and holding it when as human beings, we're, we're hardwired to be, um, uh, to have instant gratification and we've got to do delayed gratification when we're doing all that. But I love get taking myself outside of my, my comfort zone. And so for me, swing trading does all of that day trading didn't really do that in the end it, don't get me wrong i day traded for years but you know there was twofold i didn't get anything mentally from it and time was important oh yeah good point yusuf why does cristiano ronaldo still do adverts yes coming back to marius this question yeah why do the rolling stones in their whatever they are 80s now still tour when they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars you know it's having a purpose it's having that sense of whatever you know and so yeah um uh thank thank you mark uh that's very kind of you um uh is the nasdaq safe to trade yeah yeah um yeah it's a it's a big u.s stock index it's just they move around a lot but um but yeah it's safe uh where do you watch the recording later on <laughs> uh david uh the uh the website um, if i go back here i'm gonna pop this link again oh you mean the recording from today tonight's recording won't come on to this website i guess for uh, i don't know because it's their mar their uh marketing department or whatever uh have to put it together so um i would allow a week and then it will be then put onto here. I would I would say about a week, David. Yeah. Am I still pumping iron, Andy? I had a session with my personal trainer at four o'clock this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, uh, I. What's your average stop loss size in pips on a swing trade? Well, Brett, it will vary. Um. Um, it will really vary bearing in mind like i've already said i trade the euro dollar a lot so some some swing trades if i'm getting in later on in a move then i'll quite happily have 150 pip stop if i manage to get in off a low like let's say this turn down here i might well get in with a 40 or 50 pip stop um Sometimes it might even be a 30 pip stop if there's been an intraday, like off an hourly chart set up, then yes, I could end up with a 30 pip stop and then turning that into a swing trade. But um, but yeah, 30 to 50, 30 would be the absolute smallest, but 50 still good because if I got in here with a 50 pip stop and I'm looking to run that a lot higher um, up to, let's say, 115, well, you know, the, the risk to reward is, I uh, don't know what that is. It's a lot. Um, we're looking at, you know, 1 to 15 to 1 to 20 by the time add, or possibly even more than that. So, um, so yeah. But some of the add-in trades, I usually have bigger stops on. But when I'm getting in off of a pullback, 
then yeah, they can have relatively tight swing trade stops. Yeah. Um, I'm getting through some of these questions. What about using prop firms, uh, Norman? Uh, they seem to be all the range, but I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, I'll let you into a little secret, uh, Norman. Uh, certainly here in the UK, um, I don't think prop firms will be around in two years' time. The FCA here hate them um, because of what they t- because of what it is. It's not real trading. It's not real money. Their demo accounts and all of that, and this whole paying challenge fees and oh, so um, there you go. I don't think they're going to be around in you know a couple of years or so's time. Or if they are around, they'll be massively regulated and they'll they'll completely change i'm not a fan um i i i think pay, people should should aim to trade their own money you'll net you'll you'll trade your own money better you're not at the mercy of a prop firm who might widen spreads on you because they don't want to do a payout if you if you were to be in a position where you were getting payouts after a couple of months and they'll be like oh no that person's and I know this because I've spoken to people that have worked for some of these prop firms. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll widen the spreads out over the weekend to catch some traders, you know. So I am not um, a fan. Okay. Um, do you have a swing trade on the euro dollar at the moment? Um, I don't know, uh, Davey. I couldn't possibly say. Um, I think that uh, there's your answer. Uh, I might be, Yes. <laughs> Look, the bottom line is I am pretty much never flat in the market all year long. So I'm always in trades. So, um, and if 80% of my trading is euro dollar, there, there's your answer. Uh, am I on X? I am, but I don't post a lot on it, uh, Mark. I do. I just post up some of my videos, but not a lot. Um, check me out on Instagram uh, or my YouTube channel. I put, you know, good few videos on YouTube. Um, how many of the points of checklist must be met for you to open a trade? Um, if the Rister is roared is really good, Matus, um, then I would take a five out of ten. Because if it's got a really good risk to reward ratio profile, even though it does it's missing a few of the criteria, I might actually take a five out of ten. Um yeah. I think I've just answered that one for Sean. Um yeah. Sean, I'm not a fan of them. They're they're you know, there's a lot of rules. They do it on purpose because then, you know, the people will get paid payouts and all of that, but then eventually they all falls over and stuff i'm just not a fan so um do just have a brokerage account do it the right way um if the fca in the uk are looking to ban them um it says all you need to know (laughs) there you go so um or looking to do something to heavily regulate them and change their entire uh makeup in the next few years so yeah i wouldn't and i literally just heard this through the grapevine via a contact in the city literally last week uh do you ever hatch your trade uh trades uh, if yes do you use different lot when doing it sorry uh sam i don't know what hatch your trades means uh you'll have to oh blimey i've got 58 messages i'm still trying to work my way down I don't know what that means. You'll have to explain. Uh, new traders, is it advisable to go to prop or investor? Oh, I've already covered that. Uh, mm-hmm. um, oh, Marius. Okay. I don't know if Marius is gone, but that week, because that was 20 minutes ago, I've just got to Marius's uh, answer. Uh, what advice would you get? Would you, can you offer swallowing? Oh, I've already covered that one. Um, Uh, same situation Ruben um yeah you were in financial services for 11 years trading was your answer yeah um but for me it wasn't enough in the end um because I felt empty and I um let's put the uh, let's put the slide back on um yeah I felt a bit empty uh just trading I needed more 
and I needed to have a sense of purpose. So, yeah. Um, what do you mean by drawdown? Uh, I understand it to be a withdrawal. No, no. A, a, a drawdown is your equity. So you're trading in your account and your account goes from 10,000 and it gradually grows to 10,500 and 10,000, <coughs> sorry, 11,000. And then you go for a drawdown, a losing period, basically. So then, you know, you go for a losing period. So it goes from 11,000 back down to 10,500. It's a losing period, a series of losing trades or un an unprofitable period. Um, that's what a draw drawdown is. Um, 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 oh, Dominic on the TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't pick those videos. I just turn up at the studio and they just sit me in front of a, uh, a screen and and say uh, there you go uh just do a load of uh as you said um uh reviews on these uh some of these influencer videos so yes it's a bit of fun yeah um where can you follow me i think i've just covered that mark um but yeah i'm on instagram or youtube charlie burton trading I think I'm Charlie Burton trading on Instagram and I and I'm definitely Charlie Burton trading on YouTube. Um I put loads of content up there. It's good. It's a lot of trading psychology stuff on the YouTube channel and all sorts of sub subjects. So yeah. Um how do we know which currency stocks are set to trade for best profit? <laughs> <laughs> uh okay. You need to have a plan. So you need to have a straight trading strategy, you, you know. It's not about best profit. It's not. Seriously, it's not. It's about finding markets that are uh, you know, highly liquid that are just going to move well. So my advice would be to stick to the major currencies. You can look at the major cross pairs as well. That would be more than enough. There you go. Um, then you just need to have some strategies to trade those with. Will there be a recording? Yes, there will be. It will go onto that website, uh, as I've said, onto my hub in about a week's time, I should think. Why not go with a manager like Morgan Stanley? Sorry, I don't... Bupinda, I've lost there. I don't know what that was in relation to. You'll have to expand on that. Um, I'm scrolling down. I've got... Oh, no, I've got 62 messages now. Uh, could you share your slides and notes? Are you not allowed to? Uh, Andrew, um, I could share the slides. Um, I wouldn't know how to do it. <laughs> there are no notes, Andrew. I don't do notes. It's just these slides. But um, so, you know, the, the this presentation will be made available on the site, on that web page. It will get uploaded onto it in the next week. If you want to explain to me how I can share uh, the presentation into, um, I don't know if you can, just have a look, see, there's button, buttons down here, don't know. Okay, um, uh, very, currently, uh, Yavita, uh, you are currently trading a very small account because you're not consistently profitable. Yes, good, okay, keep it small then. You have the money to trade 100 times the size, but I don't feel very confident. How do I scale up in a healthy way? Well, at the moment, so you're obviously a fear-based trader. Nothing wrong with that. So you've got to deal with the psychological aspects of being a fear-based trader. So um, so because confidence is an issue. So yeah, just carry on trading at the small size until you build confidence. There's no point in trading with more money until you've i always say earn the right earn the right to trade with more money so if you haven't earned the right yet just carry on doesn't matter stay with the small account and uh, over time you will then earn the right to do it and then scale up in a small way so um for argument's sake, if your account was five hundred dollars, oops, five hundred dollars now, and and let's say you've been trading really well, 
and it, let's say, for argument's sake, it ends up at a thousand dollars. I don't know. Um, don't go and then put you know twenty thousand dollars into the account. I've covered this offer earlier on. Uh, you need to just put small incre- incremental add-ins in, so that psychologically you can get used to it. So small add-ins. Uh, Yusuf. Oh, I think I've caught up. Oh, no, I haven't. Somehow it's taken me right to the bottom. Uh, I don't know why. Um, is the... Um, are we still going? <laughs> just, I think we are. Okay, yeah. No, no, I'm just making sure that the recording's still there because <laughs> cause it's taken me right way down to the, uh, to the bottom there. Um, Uh, right, so I'm now going to have to start scrolling back up because I've missed the chunk. It's just literally just uh, probably because there was I uh, last looked, it was 68 unread messages, and it's probably just skipped me right to the bottom. So apologies about that. Um, oh no, that's right. Uh, did Charlie? I'm currently trading. Oh no, I've covered that. Oh no, maybe that's it. Um, yeah, Bupinda, are you still there? Um, you you said about something about J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley. Um, so, uh, but okay, I've caught up. Wow, has everyone gone to sleep now? Uh, by the way, oh, okay. Yusuf said uh, people can easily Google the page uh, Tick Mill Charlie Burton Trading. There you go. So you can do that anyway. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions uh, coming through. So it looks like we're there. I've answered. All the questions. Yes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll hold fire just in case anyone's got a last question, but I think we've done a reasonable amount now. We've been going for about two hours, just under two hours now. So I was going to take myself off for a run this evening, but it's dark now. So um, maybe I won't. <laughs> anyway, look, um, Stay on Tick Mill's list. There, I'll do another webinar next week, uh, next month. Sorry, in October. Um, keep your eye on that web page because the other this webinar will be loaded onto it. Do check out the other webinars on there. Contact Jet Giuseppe if you need to, and um, yeah, in stay trade safely. Watch your risk. I'm preaching to the converted, I'm sure, but um, yeah, hopefully I'll see you again soon. Take care for now.